Fantastic, my friend. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Okay. You are in Montana, no? Um, so I've actually moved. I'm, I'm currently, um, because at Edge Impulse, we work remotely. Uh -huh. uh, or, or a lot of us do. So I'm currently just traveling around the United States. So uh, okay. right now I'm in um, the deserts in Southern California. I don't know if you can wow. see out of the window, but it's just yeah. desert going off for hundreds fantastic. of miles. So pretty, pretty fantastic. cool. Fantastic, fantastic. Okay, well, I, I think that the best day I will, I, I, I will start to live with you. Well, first of all, then, thanks a lot to be here. I think that we are very, very honored to have you here in, in our class today. As you know, I, as, I, as you are following us since the beginning, this is the first TNML course in, Latin, in all Latin America. I think it's the, in, in, in reality, for engineering school, is the, the second one. The first one was Harvard, and this is the in the uh, UNFA, in the Federal University of Tejubá, Brazil. Uh, guys, for, for my students and some colleagues here, uh, only a little bit about Dan. Dan is, is leading today the, the embedded uh, machine learning R&D area, research and development at uh, Edge Impulse, okay? And, uh, and he's also a, a lecturer, lecturer, guest in, uh, in Harvard and uh, Berkeley, in both universities. Uh, and now, more important, he's also a, a lecturer, I, I guess the lecturer here in the, here in, in Brazil, in UNIFE Brazil. I learned, I learned about, about, about um, TNML, or not, in fact, it's not TNML, about the TensorFlow Lite the first time at the end, the, in 2019, when I saw Dan in a, in, a, in a Congress talking about that. He was in that time, and he worked for Google, Google AI in that time. But my friend, I'm very honored, and the floor is yours, OK? If you want well, to well, present, be, be free. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank, thank you so much. I mean, you know, the, the honor is all mine. It's a, a big, big deal to be invited to speak to all of you. And we really love the work that Marcelo, you do at, um, in, in, you know, advocacy for embedded machine learning. And it's so exciting that this is the first course in, in Latin America. And all of you are, you know, incredibly fortunate because this is a really, really new field. The field itself has only been around for a couple of years and you're going to be graduating with, you know, as deep an understanding of it as anybody has. And you're right there at the beginning and you can really make your mark. So it's really exciting. Um, I, you know, I, I feel jealous of all of you. Um, so I've, I've got some um, slides today that I, I can hopefully present. Um, so let me share my screen. And um, also, I want to apologize in advance if my um, internet becomes slow. So I currently have, I'm, I'm out here, like I mentioned, in the, in the middle, middle of the desert. And um, my internet connection is not very good. I have three different internet connections. So if this one breaks, I'll switch on to another one. Um, and that one will work. So if I disappear for a second, don't worry, I'll be back. Um, okay. But I apologize in advance if that ends up. No, but it's very good. I think at least here in Chile, I, I'm, I'm seeing everything okay. Okay, perfect. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll, I want to make this a bit interactive as well. But you know, I know everybody's not always uh, excited about speaking on on camera and everything. So um, I'll ask some questions and I'll stop, and we can have some discussion. Um, but. Uh, you know, we'll see how it goes. And I, I'm going to go through some slides and then I can show you some some live demo stuff as well. And it would be great if we can have some some conversation and I'm happy to answer questions and, and things like that. So and, and then just to double check on the timing, um, how long how long should I present for? No, I mean, uh, in, in principle, uh, we spare the first hour of the class for you. But I mean, it's your time. I mean, don't, don't worry about that. Okay, could okay, be perfect. less, and I hope I hope more. But I mean, the time that you think is necessary. I think that your your speech here is, fun, is fantastic for us. Uh, then okay, okay, awesome. And and feel free to jump in if there's anything I can explain better, or if okay. there's more detail that would be useful, or less detail, or completely different topic that you'd like to talk about. Um, but I, I kind of wanted to start with just this discussion of you know 
what is embedded ML and what's, what are the philosophies behind embedded ML? So a lot of this is going to be things you've already touched on or, or be, be familiar with um, through the work that you've done in your course. But um, I, you know, I want to kind of give you my take on it and why I think this is such an exciting field and why I think this is such an important moment for technology, you know, and, and the history of technology even. So I, I guess to introduce myself, so this is this is me there on the left back when I had shorter hair. Um, but um, I, I work at Edge Impulse, I lead Embedded ML um, at Edge Impulse. So we have a little team of engineers um, and we, we basically try to figure out like what, is, what are the things that people want to do with machine learning and how do we allow people to do that stuff on embedded devices, um, even if they don't have a background in machine learning. So our product is designed for people who have a background in embedded development and want to bring their domain knowledge to building a product that happens to use machine learning. And so that, that idea of um, domain knowledge is something that I'll come back to a few times, I think, because I think that's really important. Um, but bef before I was at Edge Impulse, I was on the TensorFlow team at Google. That's in the, uh, in the picture with me, that's Pete Warden from the TensorFlow Lite team at Google. Um, and I helped launch the um, TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers library um, back when that first came out. And I was lucky enough to, to be able to write the tiny ML book with Pete, which was a, a really cool experience. I feel very fortunate to be able to, to have done that. Um, I also help out with the tiny ML foundation. So we run a bunch of um, talks that are on YouTube. You can you can go check those out or you can watch them streaming. If any of you are interested in ever doing a talk about this topic, please just let me know. And you can get my email from Marcelo, but um, I, you know we're always excited to have more speakers. So if you're interested, that's a, a venue open to anyone who wants to share projects and that type of thing. And before, before I did any of this, a place where I got my first sort of taste of um, doing machine learning in conjunction with embedded devices was I started this company called Tiny Farms and we were farming insects for food um, at like a massive scale. And that's a whole other story I don't want to go into right now, but essentially we were building agricultural technology um, platform for raising insects. And that was where I first sort of realized that there's this amazing potential for taking the signals that are produced from sensors around an industrial environment and being able to understand what's going on and do something with that data right where it's collected. Um, so this is kind of like my, my rough agenda for this talk, but I, you know, you can ignore the 60 minutes part. We'll just go at whatever rate we want. Um, and I'll, I'll, you know, go on some things a bit deeper and some things a bit lighter. But I do want you to ask lots of questions. If anyone has a question, I've got the window open here. So if you have a, a question you want to type it, then I can I can see that. And perhaps Marcelo, you would be able to, to read it as well. Um, okay. Or if you you want to just say say your question, then that's totally fine as well. Um, so this is something you probably know, right? Which is you know, what are edge and embedded devices? So I want to just kind of set some things so we can talk about it more easily. So when we talk about embedded devices, um, you know, one one big category that's important there are microcontrollers, another is digital signal processors. So generally when I'm talking about these, I'm going to be talking about things that have either no or like a minimal real-time operating system. You're mostly running code on bare metal and, and writing your code in C or C++. Um, there might be a bit of hardware acceleration for some things. There's like increasing numbers of accelerators coming on the market um, that are built around machine learning, which is quite exciting. But on the other end of the spectrum, some of these devices might not even have uh, floating point units. So these, there's a big range of things that fit into this category, but roughly they're optimized for cost energy efficiency and size. So these are the, the really important things that we're going to be keeping on coming back to. Um, so examples here, are some of my, my favorite toys. Um, this is the, the Arduino Nano 33 BLE Sense, which I really like as just a kind of all around dev board. I think you've, you've probably got some experience with that now. 
Um, and that's that's a, a fairly typical middle of the road microcontroller if we're talking about workloads for tiny ml so this is what i use as my like mental benchmark is this nordic nrf 528840 so when i think about tiny ml um what i'm usually thinking about is something in this realm so we have 256 kilobytes of ram um so you know it's a lot for a computer a couple of decades ago um but it's not uh, well a few decades ago um, but these days, that's a very small amount. We've got a 64 megahertz clock speed, which is is pretty decent. You know, I remember playing video games on a slow processor than that, like back back not too long ago. Um, and you've got about a megabyte of flash storage. So I'd say that's kind of typical of the type of devices that we see um, our customers wanting to use with Edge Impulse. So the, the goal here, it uses very little energy, right? Tens of, of microamps at, at, at three volts. And it's very cheap, um, this, this microcontroller. And this is, this is really what I would imagine the majority of embedded um, ML workloads are gonna run on something that looks kind of like this. So this is another example of something that's a little bit more domain oriented. So um, this is Hymax's WiseEye Plus um dev board and it basically it has an asic and a dsp and a, a processor which are designed to do a specific task for embedded ml so in this case it's vision so they have some stuff in hardware that helps support the task of doing embedded vision so the other the other things that are a little bit different about this is vision models tend to be a little bit bigger um, so we've got a little bit more flash storage. We've got two megabytes instead of one megabyte. Um, we have a much faster clock because um, we're running these vision models, which are bigger and more complex. You're doing big convolutions over quite large inputs, you know, typically like a 96 by 96 um, RGB input we're, we're doing convolutions over. So you, you want to have a bit of a faster processor to be able to do that um, and still have near real time. If I talk about this this guy, you know, if you're going to be running a, a typical vision model, you, you know, maybe a two or three hundred kilobytes vision model uh, based on mobile net running on this, it's going to take maybe ten seconds to run potentially, uh, depending on the model, obviously. But um, you know, you're talking about not being able to do vision in real time, whereas with this thing, you can do do vision in um, closer to real time. So that might be important if you're trying to respond to things that are happening quickly. Um, and then you have more RAM because obviously you, you need more RAM to do these, these big convolutions over a larger input as well and do things like decoding or encoding images. So you'll definitely see some variation in these devices. And this is really important when you, you're thinking about the starting a project to do something with embedded ml you do need to think about like what is the hardware that i get to choose from like can i freely pick a target in which case maybe i can pick this um HiMax chip because it works really well for vision if i'm doing something with vision or am i constrained very often we see and this is something you'll see if you go out into industry that a, a lot of our customers are trying to add embedded machine learning to a product that already exists it's already out there on the market so imagine you've got like a, a pair of headphones or something like that um, that your company already makes and you want to add some intelligence to it one of the big benefits people are seeing of, of embedded ml is that suddenly you can do much more sophisticated stuff on an existing hardware product after a firmware update but that makes the job a lot more difficult for us as engineers because we've got to figure out how do we get the stuff we want to do to work on this constrained device where there's no flexibility at all about picking, hey, this is the best part to do the job. Um, so this is something that's, you know, it's, it's really common to have to do that kind of thinking of how can I, you know, constrain this problem so that it fits on the hardware that I have available. Um, so the other big thing, which um, it's a little bit, you know, out of scope for for tiny ml but it's there's almost like a continuum here between the smaller targets and the bigger ones um we often end up seeing people want to deploy stuff on system on chip devices so um that's where you've got 
a whole computer, but it's a small one. And you've got a real operating system. You can program in any language. Um, you might have all kinds of accelerators on board. So you've probably seen things like the um, Google Coral or NVIDIA Jetson Nano. Those would fall into this category too. Um, so these are optimized for performance first. So they're optimized to be fast and capable in general. And then cost and energy efficiency and size are important, but they're not the top thing. So some examples here, we've got the Raspberry Pi. So that's got a quad, quad core 64 bit system on chip, similar specs to like a, a, a desktop computer, right? So it has a lot of RAM, two to eight gigabytes of RAM. So you're never gonna run out of RAM doing, you know, a normal type of inference based on a, a sensor input. You've got a really fast processor and it, it uses a lot more power, but it's still not a huge amount compared to like a, a big thing, like a, a, a PlayStation or something that's that's like a, a full high power system doing a lot of graphics processing or something. Um, so kind of a subset of this category are the ML accelerators. So um, this is stuff like I mentioned NVIDIA's Jetson Nano. It's essentially like a little GPU that you can have on a, a single board computer um, and this is really if you're if you're trying to do some real heavy lifting so the, the one thing that's nice about these types of um, computers is that they're very easy to work with they require a lot less kind of specific engineering skills than microcontrollers do so what we see is a lot of people who are doing things in conservation for example are using these types of computers because um, if you are a conservation researcher, so in, in biology these days, a lot of people have tend to have a lot of pretty good computational skills. Like they're, they're, they're good at working with, um, you know, information technology broadly. Um, so they, they know how to write scripts on Linux and like run stuff on, an, on a Linux machine, but they don't necessarily know how to write software for embedded devices, which is it's like a very, you know, Kind of nuanced and and difficult field to to be in. Um, so when when these people who are doing projects like wildlife tracking or monitoring um, different types of things to do with climate, or it's essentially scientists who are going out in the field building tools that use embedded machine learning to understand what's going on with the world. Often these are the tools that they're most familiar with, um, where you've got a, a full system on a board. So it's really useful as a practitioner to kind of know about these as well, because um, they're, they're very universal. A lot of people find them very easy to use. And it's, it's not just in, you know, science. Um, it's also in industry. These are really easy to work with. They're as easy to attach peripherals. So a lot of industrial automation and factory stuff, it's very easy to bring these types of boards in and hook them up to, to whatever sensors you already have. Um, so that's why it's really good to know about these. and then. For the more hardcore stuff where you're doing like inference on multiple streams of video concurrently, maybe um, something like a Jetson Nano would be helpful. So this is more like if you if performance really, really matters. So me personally, I don't care about these devices so much. Um, to me, the fun is with all the constraints and the challenges of making something work on a bare minimum. Um, but there's also really cool fun stuff you can do on these larger devices too. And it all depends on the application. So why would you run ML on these? So hopefully, you know, I, I, I think people can give some good, exa uh, good answers to that already. But I always like to talk about this acronym. Um, it, it was coined by someone in the space a, a, a year or so back. Um, and I just think it's really, really useful as a filter for figuring out whether something makes sense as a tiny ml project because the the thing with engineering and especially with machine learning is everybody wants to do it um everyone wants to add machine learning to their products and everyone wants to do machine learning on the edge now it's become very trendy and you'll talk to customers who they'll say oh we've got this problem or that problem and we really want to solve it using edge machine learning and your job as an engineer really is to say okay this is the problem you have is this actually a good fit for doing it on an embedded device on the edge which has loads of constraints and is fairly difficult 
or would it be better to do it in a different way, maybe on a big server with an internet connection where your life is generally easier? So this is the filter that I use for trying to, to make those decisions. So we have bandwidth, latency, economics, reliability, and privacy. And so this was coined by Jeff Beer. If you, if you search for Jeff Beer and Blurt, he's got a, a really nice blog post about it. Um, so, pardon me, the, the first thing is bandwidth. So um, this is something I'm very aware of being in my desert um, location with my terrible internet connection. So often you're not going to have enough bandwidth to send data from a sensor upstream. And so typically this is something you're going to run into um, either if you're doing something with a, a high bandwidth sensor. So imagine like a, a vision sensor, you, you can't necessarily be streaming video everywhere all the time, but also things like radar. So where you've got this like very high frequency signal um, generating a lot of data points, and it's not always feasible to send that from a device to a server. And you might think, well, there's, there's Wi-Fi everywhere, there's 4G internet in lots of places and so on. But in some sometimes we have extremely limited bandwidth. So there's a, a technology called LoRa, L-O-R-A, which is basically a um, standard for wireless communication at extremely low power with extremely low bandwidth. And the idea is that LoRa devices can send basically a few packets a day. So imagine you have this hardware device, it's deployed somewhere in the field, and it only gets to send literally a few numbers each day, telling the back end systems what's going on. So in that case, it becomes literally impossible to send anything other than tiny amounts of information. And sensor data probably doesn't fit into that. And so one, one of the projects we built, I'll, I'll show you a little bit of this later on, um, but we, we built this project where um, we had this LoRa radio that could communicate from anywhere on Earth up to a network of satellites that are set up to receive them. And it's super low power. So you can deploy this somewhere for you know months and months running on a single battery charge. Um, and we had a little model running on it, listening out for a, a certain species of bird. It's, it's a parrot which has become resident in Amsterdam. It, it, it must be a very like cold tolerant parrot because it's it's living in Amsterdam um, as an invasive species. And so this little thing we built, you can put it anywhere and it will listen out for that parrot. And the, the model just tallies up, how often do I hear the parrot? Um, and at the end of the day, it can just send one message with the total number of parrots it heard that day um, or parrot calls it heard that day um, through this satellite network and back to where you're collecting the information. And it just wouldn't be possible to send the audio through that network because you're only allowed to send a few numbers at a time. So that's really a good example of why bandwidth is important. Latency is similar. So latency, that's like, imagine you're um, building something that controls a industrial robot in a fast moving environment. So you might have this, this robot that's responding and it needs to stop when somebody walks into its range because they might get hit by it moving around. So if you were to build that using a traditional ML system where you have a server somewhere um, running the model um, and you're sending video, even if you have high bandwidth because you're in a factory somewhere, you're sending live video to that model, running the model and then sending the results back, the time it takes to do that round trip you know, you could maybe me measure that, it might be hundreds of milliseconds, and maybe that's too slow. And maybe that means someone could walk in front of the robot and the robot doesn't know when to stop in time and it hits them. Um, so a way to solve that problem, same thing, you know, the, the biggest example of that is with self-driving cars, which are basically robots driving around on the road. You can't do that processing for self-driving cars in the cloud somewhere you have to do it in the car because they have to respond immediately if someone walks out in front so latency extremely important and a, a way to address that is by running a model on device because even if the model might run a bit slower because it's running on a, a more constrained computing environment 
the round trip time may be lower. Uh, so it's it's really important to do some stuff very fast. And so for things that are important in that regard, um, running on device is really, really helpful. So e economics is also really important. So um, for example, having a network connection can be extremely expensive. You know, if you've got like satellite data connection or you've got um, 4G or 5G mobile data connection, those are really expensive. Um, so you can't necessarily afford to send a lot of data. Also, just having a system set up with a back end is, is challenging. Like if you're creating a device that it's just meant to be sold as a $5 kind of disposable item, maybe it's a medical device that people will just use once for a procedure and then throw away. You want it to be cheap, as cheap as possible. And so if you don't need to include a radio, if you can include a much smaller battery, if you don't need to think about building back-end infrastructure, as in web servers and things, to support communicating with a server that your model runs on, you can save a ton of money and make stuff possible that isn't possible otherwise. Same with reliability. So reliability is um, you know, very connected with these other things because often networks are your worst enemy when it comes to reliability. So um, having a network connection means the network connection can go down if you're dependent on it. Um, it also reduces your battery life because network communication is usually the biggest drain on power consumption for uh, an IoT device. So if you have a device deployed in the field somewhere and it has to keep communicating all the time on the network, that's going to burn most of your energy budget. Um, and there are lots of applications where reliability is just incredibly important. Uh, things to do with safety or healthcare, or even just for user experience. Like you, you really want people to have a good user experience with your product. Um, things like a smart speaker, it's very helpful to run the model on device because then it will always work and it's not dependent on there being an, a good internet connection. And then my favorite thing here is privacy. And this is a little bit of more of a, um, a, a subtle one because you might think, okay, well, privacy, it's kind of optional, right? If I don't care about privacy for a product I'm using, then it doesn't matter. But there are tons of products that are possible if you have perfect privacy that are not possible if you don't. So a good example I, I like of that is um, if you were going to have a product in your home, like a camera that's looking out for some situation. So one of those might be in the bathroom. Like we often have, um, if you go into a public place, there are uh, taps in the bathroom where you wash your hands and it's automatic. And it basically uses a, a, an infrared sensor to detect when your hands are there. And they never work very well, do they? Like you, you put your hands in there and you have to move them around to the right spot to get it to trigger. And sometimes it just doesn't work at all and it keeps shutting off. So that's really, really annoying. And what you could do is you could train a machine learning model to understand when someone's hands are in front of the tap. So that sounds a lot better because you can get much better accuracy because you, you can look at a wide field of view and you can see where the hands are there. Um, and, and I think you can make that work really well model wise, but people don't want to have a camera in the bathroom looking at them when they're in the bathroom. If you try to launch a product that, that featured that, you wouldn't get anyone buying it. It would be an absolute disaster because people are not interested in in having that kind of intrusive thing in their home that would be taking pictures and streaming them to some server outside of their home or outside of the, the office that they're in. So if you instead build this product using ML at the edge, so you're running a little model and no data ever leaves the device. And in fact, you don't even have a network connection. You make it impossible for any information to ever leave the device. Then suddenly you have something that guarantees your privacy and you can build this product, which, you know, if you, if you couldn't guarantee privacy, no one would want it. But if you could, then maybe it's really helpful and it could save a ton of water and make people's, you know, day-to-day -day life have less friction. 
so that's those are, those are some some examples of, of things in all of these categories and i guess like i i kind of wondering does anyone have any good like applications that they've thought of or know about that like benefit from one of these um factors if anyone does feel free to type that out in the uh in the chat but what, then a question what think oh yeah no, i mean no, no, i mean i mean only a small a quick question when you talk about the uh, right reliability this make a um a kind of a, some opposition with the problem with the memory that that we we told before or not because it seems to me complicated to to be reliability but the reliability and the memory you know the low memory device yeah yeah so that's a, a good question and that's that's kind of where the the engineering comes in because these these are like the ideal world benefits um so if you if you do a really good job of executing these are what you can get but the trade off is that it is really difficult to work with these types of devices and these these kind of constrained computing environments and so that's that's a really good point because there is a, a big trade off here where we're thinking about okay in theory we could have way better latency in practice maybe latency is not as good as a network connected um system unless you have a good enough processor on the edge that can run the model quickly um reliability that might be better in theory but if you have a really really tiny model that just isn't that good it doesn't doesn't have very good accuracy because it's so small and that's the only thing you could fit on the device then maybe it would be better just to stream the data so that that is something really important to consider is like these are the best case benefits here but in the real world when you've got things like how i i mentioned where maybe you are putting this into some headphones and you have to use the existing hardware in the headphones you have to think can the hardware i'm actually able to use deliver on this blurp acronym um or is it just you know a, a lost cause because you don't have enough capability and as an engineer no one likes saying no if someone comes to you and they say oh i've got this really cool idea for something no one wants to say no but sometimes you do just have to look at the numbers and do a bit of experiment experimentation and you realize that it's not feasible and that's that's a really important thing so yeah thank you thank you for that point so in terms of of use cases so i think some of the most interesting um high level use cases here i i i've i've listed so smart sensors are a really good one so this is where you've got a sensor which would previously have to stream all of its data to the cloud so maybe it's a a camera um it might be the camera that's turning on the tap um or it could be a radar it could be an audio monitor that's detecting whether the the parrot has come by um and and started making a noise so any of those sensors you can think about what if instead of sending all the data back from the sensor i just send information when something important has happened so that's that's a really good general high level use case so um other other good use cases are privacy focused so i talked about that a lot already um the other other high level use cases are low latency things so as i mentioned that's where where safety is important or also high throughput so um if you were doing something like sorting fruit that is coming down a production line in an agricultural setting and maybe you're looking at apples and sometimes the apple comes down and it's bruised um or it's the wrong color of apple and you need to very quickly identify which those are that are coming down the the um the conveyor belt maybe and kick them off and so where you you want to do something very fast like that that's where low latency is important um and another another really cool thing is intelligent objects so this is a little bit more high level but um imagine you've got household appliances 
that understand what's going on around them contextually and can react accordingly. So that could be like a smart speaker that can understand what you say to it. But it could also be things like um, maybe your car understands what kind of terrain you're driving on and it can adjust its um, suspension. Or maybe you have a lamp in your house and the lamp will come on automatically when someone is in the room or it will go off when you leave. So those, those are, are really interesting use cases too. So there's lots of different types of data that people use with embedded machine learning. So it could be literally anything. So the, the common ones that we see um, in our customers at Edge Impulse are image data. And that doesn't have to be just normal camera data like you might take a picture with your phone. It can be all kinds of interesting image sensors. So I have a, an image here from an infrared camera um, taking a picture of an elephant. And so you can you can use all sorts of sensors that give you an image as an output. And we're, we're, one of our customers is actually working on a project where um, they're trying to identify elephants by their infrared image. So they can see them a, a long way away. They can see them if they're in the grass and, and things like that. Um, obstructing the view and they're able to tell people who live in places where there are lots of elephants when an elephant is coming into their village because elephants sometimes come in and they'll eat the farmer's food or they'll trample trample around and it's good to know when they're coming um, so these um, you know images that could be infrared it could be using some kind of other uh, exotic imaging technology uh, same with audio. So you can have audio from a regular microphone. Um, you could have audio of people speaking. You could have audio with, with you know, classifying different types of noises that are going on. But you can also have audio that humans can't hear because there's, there's you know, no reason why we need to be th thinking about the frequencies that we happen to be able to hear. So what if you could train a model that listens to super high frequency audio and it can recognize when there are bats nearby? Um, what if you can have audio that listens to really low frequency and it can measure um, the, the stress in a building or, or some kind of structure um, in, in certain conditions? Um, any kind of time series data will work well. So it could be things like very high frequency, like um, vibration data from an accelerometer. It could be less high frequency, like taking temperature readings every, every minute or every five minutes. Um, any kind of time series is good. Positional data can be interesting. So, so satellite data. Um, there's other things I haven't mentioned, like radar. Um, you've got like LIDAR combinations of these things so you you might even take the input of or the the output of some other um process like another machine learning model as your input um so the the sky's the limit really with data types um and looking at something like that's a, a good real world deployment of an embedded ml system um this is a, a collar that goes around an elephant's neck so you can just see a little part of it here, but this was designed by um, a, a company called Irinas, who are, are based in Europe. And they've built this for another company called Smart Parks. And Smart Parks basically are um, a, a, a company that work with national parks around the world in order to help them understand and, and protect the animals that they, they care for. And so this system was designed to help understand the behavior of elephants. So in the, within this black case, you have a, a microcontroller that's in the same kind of range as the ones that I was talking about earlier. Um, you have the same kind of LoRa transmitter that I was talking about. That's that thing on the left where it can communicate with um, a long range, low power radio. And you have a battery that can last a really long time and you have GPS. And you have some accelerometers which can measure the movement of the elephant. And so what they've been able to do is classify the elephant's activity and its location and then report that back um, via this LoRa radio so that the people working in the park and studying the elephants can better understand their behavior. 
and so this is a really good example because it's it's out there in the middle of you know wilderness far away from much connectivity you can't replace the battery very easily because it's around the elephant's neck it needs to be very reliable because they're getting deployed out into the field for a long time um, and it, it needs to have good battery life and stuff like that and um, so this is this is really a, a perfect application of, of embedded ml in the real world so here's here's the the um device on the elephant it goes on the back of his neck so it can communicate with the satellite so anyone have any ideas what this might be it's very hard i'd be very surprised if anyone knew what it was <laughs> it's um, a vibra vibration device or something like you know oh that's that's a very very interesting that's very close i mean it's it's part of it so yeah. well done um I, I so this thing it's another device um that was was developed to deploy tiny ml into a really extreme place in the field and so this device is installed um by a, a company called iso electro they're based in europe also in slovenia i think um and these devices are designed to attach to an electricity pylon and the pylons basically every so often um some of the hardware will fail and when it fails it produces a lot of sparks um it can light forest fires and it can cause power outages and so it's a really big problem because you know when this happens they have to send people out to the middle of nowhere to put out the fire to repair the power lines it could put put people at risk because of the, the fire so it would be really good if you knew when this was going to happen before it happened because right now the only way that they know it happened is that the power goes out and so this company basically thought what if we could use machine learning to understand if there's going to be a problem soon so they were able to connect sensors to all of these pylons and create a data set and then they looked at which pylons failed and they, they logged all this data and they could tell that the pylons that had problems they started having the problem they started showing issues a while before there was an actual failure so they're collecting data like um high high frequency vibration data they're collecting um information about the um the power signal and the the frequencies in that and basically as as much information as they could about um what's going on in these in these installations and they were able to train a tiny model which runs on on the device it's installed inside of this thing it gathers power from the pylon itself so it can be installed there and just run forever there and it it basically looks out for if there are signs that there's going to be a failure soon and it then sends a message to uh, via low power radio to let people know so this is this is another really perfect example because it's out somewhere it's it's easy to get power here you're not worried so much about battery but bandwidth is a, a problem and cost is also a problem because you need to install these on hundreds and hundreds of these these towers so you don't want them to be really expensive so that's that's a really cool example i think of um being able to make a big difference in the world by preventing forest fires um and, and helping make sure people have reliable electricity so this is another example um so one thing you you might not know you probably have embedded machine learning running in your pocket right now because if you have an android or an iPhone, they, they both at this point run a keyword spotting model that's trained by some people that I know who work at Google. And um, that model is looking out for, or, well, if it's Android, then it's Google. If it's an iPhone, then it's Apple. Um, and that model is looking out for someone saying the, the, the hot word. So if you were to say, okay, Google, your phone will wake up and, and the Google Assistant will open. And you wouldn't be able to just keep, like on the phone you can run 
anything you want really can't you like on on the the android operating system but it uses a lot of energy and so if you want to listen all the time for someone to say this wake word then it would be be really difficult because you've got to keep the phone alive um, you've got to keep capturing audio and sending it to a server but with embedded machine learning you can have a little dsp chip which just runs the machine learning model um, and, and continually runs inference on the audio that's coming in and wakes the phone up. So that's a, a really, really key use of embedded ML as well as you, you're basically recognizing when somebody wants to wake up the larger device and do some more processing than they otherwise, uh, than, and, and, and in a situation where otherwise you would run out of battery power if you kept the large device on the whole time. Um, so this is probably the most common deployment of embedded machine learning because this is actually running on billions of devices now because there are billions of mobile phones out there in the world um, that, that run this so when you think about tiny ml it sounds very futuristic as i said it's only a few years old but it's already in billions of people's hands every single day so that's that just shows you the potential scale and impact of this technology it's already out there only a couple of years after being created um, and is, is used by billions of people. So I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about, so actually, first of all, any, any questions or thoughts or anything on, on those parts so far? Uh, Adriano, you, 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 you said that you have a question? Oh, I have, a, I saw Adriano. Yeah, I raised my hand a little, yeah. <laughs> a little while. But I, I had a question. I was uh, paying attention about you. You're talking, and you you mentioned like the auto driving cars. You know the the cars that drive by themselves. And mm -hmm. you you told us that these cars have the latency problems, right? Because you can mm -hmm. connect with the the network and hope that these cars will respond in time to prevent a crash, for example. Mm -hmm. But you have the re reliability problem as well because mm -hmm. you gotta have a really reliable device on your car to prevent that it crashes and prevent like a an accident or your user dying by using your 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 device you know but how do you conceal these things like you have a latency problem and you gotta use an tiny ml device to resolve this but a car like has a lot of components that uses energy and batteries. How do you conceal this? How do you build a model to answer this, this problem? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a, a really good question. I, I think that the key thing there is that you've, you've got this really, really complex system. Um, so a, a car, like you, you said, there's, there's dozens, maybe hundreds of components that are all doing different things that are, are competing for energy competing for control of the vehicle and there it's just this unbelievably complex system and it all has to work together um, in order to deliver someone safely from one place to another and i think that the the real thing that um is is important there is that you have this full kind of design process that thinks about how all of these individual pieces work together to create the um, the product and create uh, essentially the ability to drive safely from A to B. So I think when you're designing something that's that complicated, it's not a type of thing where every team can work in isolation. And instead, every team needs to work together and figure out what are the things that could go wrong. and how do, do our components um, you know, minimize that? Or how do you make sure they behave correctly under those conditions? So for example, if there was a problem with the, so imagine you, you've got this car that's, um, you've trained a model to help the car navigate around when it's driving. And then sometimes, you know, maybe there's like a, a one in a thousand chance at any given moment that something in the engine might fail uh, of the car and the car suddenly loses power. So you need to make sure that the model that you train 
accounts for that type of failure where maybe it's it's trying to tell the car to move and the car can't move because the engine has failed um so what does it do then and you need to make sure that your training data includes examples of that type of failure and in order to do that you need to work with the people who are working on the, the other teams in the company that's making the product to try and identify those things and address them so a, a car is a really extreme example right because it's it's so complicated and it takes so many different systems working together and there's such a big risk if, if it fails but this is the same for for everything so imagine if you made a smartwatch that can recognize which activity you're doing based on um where you're uh, what you're doing so maybe it can recognize if i'm lifting weights or it can recognize if i'm jogging based on an, an accelerometer so that's really great and maybe maybe you you're developing that you collect a data set you train a model and it works really well in the lab doing that um but maybe if you don't talk to anyone else inside your company and you think oh well we've, we've done a good job here it's working really well and then you send this watch out and you find out that for you know 20 percent of customers it doesn't work properly at all and you get all sorts of bad reports about why it doesn't work and you don't know why and then you go and ask people at your company like any anyone have any ideas what's going wrong why would it why would it not work for like some small fraction of our users and then it turns out that some of the users are left-handed and they're wearing the watch on their other wrist and you didn't train the model based on that because as an engineer you don't know about how people use the product you only know about how to build machine learning models so but if you've gone ahead and talked to people at your company who are responsible for like the industrial design and those types of considerations then you'd find out that this is a really important thing and the product needs to work for people who are left-handed and right-handed um so that's just kind of a smaller example of of where right at the beginning you need to talk to everyone in the company who understands how the product is really used because ml is uniquely you know we we, we capture these data sets that represent a particular context and if we don't capture data that represents all of the conditions under which the model is going to work, then it won't be reliable. Um, and so that's that's a really important thing. Yeah, uh, I asked this because uh, I was talking to my cousin the other day. He's a programmer too, and he's a bit, a bit older, so he's in the, the business for a long time. And he, he told me that when you're developing uh, an auto car like this, Normally, you use C or C++ to program it, like, like you said. In TinyML, you use C or C++. And he told me, like, you can use pointers in your code because they have, like, a small chance of failing mm -hmm. when your code is running, and you can crash the car because of this. So that's, that's why I ask this because yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a really tiny thing to think about, you know, because... If your model fails, you can kill a person. And it's really heavy to think about that, you know? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that that's, that's, you know, a really, really important observation with regards to this field because there are so many cool applications. Um, but we have to think very responsibly about does our product or does the model we're training actually work well for everybody? Because it, it often, if it doesn't work well for everybody, it creates danger for people or it loses money for businesses and it, it can create some really bad problems. And there are some unique ways in which machine learning is, you know, extra vulnerable to this type of thing. So one of the things that you might have seen is um, the, the discussion around ML fairness and the idea that when you're training ml models you need to really think about all of the different situations where your model might be used and make sure your training data and your test data represents all of those different situations and so a good example of that is if i was training my model for recognizing if someone's wa trying to wash their hands and i only use hands of one particular skin color then the model may not work for people who have other skin colors. And so I've built a 
terrible product that doesn't work for loads of people. And it's it's really, really important to make sure that you think about all of that stuff before your product gets shipped. Because if we're creating this smart sensor that goes inside of the sink and doesn't have an internet connection, there's no way to fix it once it's gone out there. So that it's a disaster if you ship something that doesn't work well. So you really have to start at the very beginning and think extremely carefully about how you're going to design the system, what kind of data set you need to really be comprehensive and serve everybody who's going to be using your product. Uh, Dan, uh, Stephanie uh, also has a question, Stephanie, so if you can ask her. Uh, in a data type use usage with GPS, for example, how is it handled the bandwidth and latency that you said? So if we were using GPS data um, as our input to our model, so how, how do the bandwidth and latency come into this? So yeah, that's a, a, a interesting thing. So I guess, you know, if I was talking about using GPS data, um, I would probably be trying to figure out, you know, what maybe what kind of activity is going on um, based on my movements in GPS coordinates. So that's, a, that's an example of where, you know, a situation where I might be trying to make use of GPS data. So one example of that could be um, if you have the system attached to a car, can we figure out um, what this car is currently doing? Is it is it just driving normally or is it someone who's a racing driver or is it uh, attached to a delivery truck? And you could maybe try and figure those out by um, by looking at the GPS coordinates and how how the vehicle tends to be moving, what kind of speed it's going, um, what types of um, changes in direction does it have? And where bandwidth and latency come in there, you so you might have um, you know limited access to connectivity. So this might be on a bicycle so it doesn't have much um power source so you you don't necessarily have energy there to have a um connection to a, a mobile phone network or um wi-fi you might be um in a in a in a situation where you're um generating quite high frequency gps information if you're trying to I mean, gps doesn't work with very very small distances but um there are some um some location systems which can give you that high resolution information so maybe you're looking at the movements of something on a very small scale and it's moving a lot and there are a lot of minor fluctuations so maybe you don't have enough bandwidth to send all of that information um latency it's you know, maybe less of a problem with GPS because um, your GPS, there's a, a, a bit of latency maybe anyway in, in how often you're um, getting a, a, a new fix on where you are. But it, it all depends really on your, your application. So in, so in some situations, you might have lots of access to bandwidth um, and lots of... Uh, you know, energy to spend communicating. So if you're on a, a ship, for example, like a big container ship, that's probably more likely to have a better um, ability to upload data than on a bicycle. So it depends a little bit about the particular application um, and, and, you know, what the constraints are there. I, I thought about it when it's used satellite because when we have to follow a way, it has to be quickly, so we can go to a wrong way. I see. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So, yeah, that's, you know, the, the like, being able to quickly understand, like, when you need to change direction or something like that. Um, and that, that, that definitely is a really good example of why it's helpful to have the low latency. Yes, thank you. Awesome, thank you. 
Hey Daniel, how are you? Okay. Hey, good, thank you. Uh, in the case of, of forest fire detection, do you think that the type of camera and its positioning is crucial for a good performance of the model? And if it would be interesting to add other sensors like a temperature sensor to, to have the model in detection? Yeah, that's a, a really good point, actually. So the, the, the point was, is the um, position and, and location of the sensor important? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, so actually, just one, one note is that the system I showed um, for the uh, detecting these failures in the um, power system, that doesn't actually have a camera. Um, that just uses things like vibration and the, the um, electrical signals to identify if there might be a problem. But you could definitely train a system to look out for forest fires using a camera. And the, the, the really good point I think you made is that the, um, the location of the camera and the angles and all of that type of thing are super critical. If you take pictures of something with one angle and use that in your training data, you train a model based on it, and you don't include any other examples at other angles or with other backgrounds or with different you know, qualities of um, sensor and things like that, you will get unpredictable behavior from your model because your model is, has only been exposed to data from that one angle. So essentially, you're, when you're training, you're basically taking a data set and you're taking a little bit of your knowledge that you have encoded in that data set in the form of labels. And you're, you're basically, every time the model tries to figure out um, what this thing is it's looking at and it succeeds, then you kind of give it, give it a pat on the back and you say, well done, do it more like that next time. And every time it fails you're saying hey that wasn't that good change what you do next time and it will gradually learn what the right thing to do is but if you only have examples of one type of situation it has no way of knowing what it's supposed to do you haven't given it any encouragement you haven't given it any um you know penalty it knows nothing about that type of area so if you're showing it if you if you trained this on pictures of a fire looking from the top down and then it, in the real world you try to run it on pictures looking at a fire from the side it has no idea what it's supposed to be doing there's no you know there's no information within the model that represents how to make that distinction between whether it's a fire or not and um, because the angle has changed and so that's why it's so important to have this comprehensive data set that represents all of the possible ways you might um, receive this sensor data. So uh, a, another good example of this is imagine you had a, um, uh, a microphone in your product and you, you collected the data with one kind of microphone, but then when your product is manufactured, you had to make some changes and you use a different type of microphone. I would expect there might be some penalty there. Like there might be a degradation in performance if the model was trained with data from one microphone and then it was used with another. And it might be that that's still okay. It might be that the degradation was minimal, but it's worth testing. Um, and so it, it is also, it's a really cool idea, um, as you mentioned, to to mix in other types of sensor data because that can help um, make a more robust model because you're not no longer depending on just one signal. So if to detect a fire, you're also making use of temperature um, and, and you have the camera, then that can really help. And so you don't necessarily even need to be using machine learning for that part. So imagine you've got this, this device, it has a camera, and a temperature sensor and the camera has been mounted at the wrong angle and there's a big fire but it's pointing at the fire and it can't tell that it's a fire because it, it hasn't 
got that kind of angle in its data set. So it just says, oh yeah, no, nothing's going on. But you have the temperature sensor and the temperature has gone really, really high. Maybe you should send a alert anyway um, and let people know that there might be a fire. And you couldn't do that if you didn't have those, those both sensors on there. So that's, that's a really good point. Oh, really nice. Uh, so I have been working with this project with Mateus Laura, and one thing that I, I've noticed, noticed uh, is that the model works very well in differentiation fire and non fire cases. But the problem happens with sunset images, where the model mistakes it for a fire situation. So to deal with this problem, uh, I downloaded some sunset images, but and put them in the, in the, the database, but uh, I saw that there was some improvement, but it's still not 100%, you know. That was the main problem that I, I saw. Yeah, that's really interesting. So that, that's where you can think about things like, you know, the ultimate combination of temperature sensor and a camera would be a, an infrared camera, um, which, you know, they're, they're very expensive. Um, but that might be something that could solve that problem because you could look at pictures of the uh, fire with a um, infrared camera and you'll see how the heat is distributed. And with the sunset, I'd imagine that the, the temperatures are different and they're distributed in a different way. Uh, it's a really good idea. I will think about it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Hi, Dan. Uh Nice talk. Uh, yeah, we, we, you were talking, we were talking about uh, automatic cars and how they need to take decisions when they're working. And I thought about, I mean, a, a device that could help blind people to identify possible ob obstacles in their way. I mean, mm -hmm. is that feasible? I mean, because you just would need a, like a, a glass in a small device, so you, you wouldn't even need a lot of power to do that and i think it can help a lot of people well. yeah that's that's a really good idea i mean I, I think i may have seen someone doing something like that um already and i did a quick google search and it seems like um there are some people who there's some researchers who have built that type of thing so um yeah there's one i found i'll post it in the the chat here um so it looks like they've they've helped you um, detect tree branches that are hanging down, um, nice. so that you don't walk into them if you, you can't see them. So that's that's a really cool example, um, and you know that fits all of these different things that we care about. We we don't want it to be using lots of of bandwidth. Um, we we need very low latency. So that's a, a perfect application for tiny ML. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you know, just a commentary because I was thinking while you were talking that. Yeah, no, that's, that's ideas really cool. Come, come, yeah. <laughs> I think you know it's 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 so early in this technology's history that there are just so many possibilities out there um, that you could think of and build a product around or do some research around. It's it's really exciting. Most people who are developing products out there in industry haven't even heard of this technology yet so it's it's very cool so i've got a question question from Matthias in the the messaging yeah so that's a really good good question so it's about can you can you create kind of an architecture where for different things within the uh, you know that you you care about you have some models making decisions um, and you have some models making decisions about other things so maybe you could have a if you've, you've got a car and then you, you want it to understand what's going on around it you could have some models that deal with vision um, and some models help it understand when someone's walking in front of a car you might have other models that are dealing with audio so maybe it can tell when someone's beeping the horn at you um, and then you have another model that those inputs go into and it makes a decision based on them. And that's, that's a really common architecture actually for um, deploying embedded machine learning. And it's called a, a cascading architecture. So the idea is that, um, and it, well, 
it's 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 called an ensemble an ensemble architecture is where you use multiple models to predict the same thing and a cascading architecture is where you use different models to trigger other models so another example of that is on that google um google assistant so you have the small model um that listens for someone saying hey google and then you have a much bigger model that runs on the cloud and requires more energy to run um, and that actually recognizes what you're saying and what question you're asking and those models are connected together in a way that we call it a, a cascade so the idea is that first this very basic model is running um, which is listening out for whether someone's saying one particular phrase and then second when this model gets triggered, when it, it recognizes someone is saying the phrase, it wakes up the next model and the next model does much more difficult work. And you could even make that like a three stage cascade. You could have one model that determines, is somebody speaking right now? And that model could be really, really small because it's doing something very simple and easy. So it doesn't use much energy to run. Then you have a second model, which is, recognizing what someone said and whether they said hey google and then you have the third model which can really transcribe what someone's saying and um you know transcribe the speech and help answer the question and you could do that in any kind of system you know you, if, if you have a if there's a way that you can keep your device asleep a bit longer by running a small model um and only wake it up when you need to that's really helpful So yeah, you know, sometimes you can even put them all in the same model, but you only run parts of it as well. So there's some interesting research around doing that um, too. There's there's a lot of cool stuff going on around looking at architectures of, of models. Okay, cool. So I can I can kind of whiz through a bit more. How are we doing for time? Uh, it's up to you. I mean, doesn't matter. We have two hours of class. I can the class that I was prepared after you. I can do the next week. So, <laughs> I mean, if you have more to to tell us, go okay. On. So I can I I can go I can go through this next stuff pretty pretty quick. Um, so I wanted to talk about you know what's needed to make Tiny ML work. So there's there's a bunch of different things. I kind of showed you a flash of of things there, but in terms of technologies. What what kind of technologies do we need to make tiny ML work? Does anyone have any thoughts um, of what would be some important things that we need? People, come on. Uh, you would not. Uh, you, you would need to have some kind of way to make the models. Uh, smaller, right? To run your training in a computer, and you need to make it smaller to fit in a uh, embedded application, right? Yeah, exactly. That's a that's a really good one. Um, so I, I, that's that's a very important one. Having some way to make the models smaller so that they fit on the device, you need to deploy them. So really good point as well from Rodrigo. Low consumption hardware, so hardware that's efficient and can. Um, run run models without using loads of power. That's very important. Any any more ideas? A data set with less as possible bias. Yeah, definitely. So a data set where you have as little bias as possible um, and where it's been carefully constructed to represent the situation your device is going to be deployed in. That's very, very important. That's probably the most important thing. All right, so really, really good suggestions there. So I've got, I'm going to share the ones I came up with. Um, so we want to have, first of all, these are not in any particular order, really. They're all, all very important. Um, and I didn't even include the data set, which is a really bad omission. So I'll add that one. Um, so thank you for that one. Um, 
but so first of all you oh i did sorry i did i didn't didn't spot it at the bottom um so um you need tiny models uh so you you need models that can run on on these devices and some of the other stuff that is in here um is important for getting that like model compression helps you get a tiny model but you also have to have models that you've you've thought about how can i make this model um run on uh, a, a small device like how do i need to change the architecture so that it can fit within the memory constraints that we have um as as we heard you need a suitable data set that's you know geared towards the the actual place where this model is going to be deployed and the, the people who are going to be using it um you need model compression like we also heard so some way of taking a model and reducing the size of it while keeping the performance approximately the same it doesn't always have to be exactly as good as it was before sometimes it's fine to to lose a bit of performance for some applications you don't need perfect performance um, but having some mechanism for that and then to understand how the model's actually performing you need some good metrics so your metrics that you come up with need to be relevant for the actual application that you have so if we're talking about like a um a smartwatch that can tell what kind of exercise you're doing what are the metrics we want to use for that is it that like um how how many minutes of exercise does it correctly categorize that sounds like it might be a good good metric to have um, and that might be a more valuable metric than just saying what is the percentage accuracy it gets on the test data set? So designing some metrics that help you understand whether this thing is working well before and after you compress the model and before and after you deploy it on device rather than just running it in, in the lab. And that, another thing you need is optimized kernels. So this is when we're talking about the, the fundamental operations um, in, in running a um, deep learning model. So things like fully connected layers, convolutions, um, all of our activation functions. We have to have optimized versions of these that run on the devices that we're targeting. So often, you know, even if, even if a device sounds perfect, it's got a really, really nice, powerful processor, um, but it doesn't use much energy. Unless we have optimized code for running the model on that device, maybe it will still be slow. Um, you might have a, a really, really fast um, mod, a really, really fast device, um, but it doesn't have a floating point unit. And if you don't have kernels that are um, able to make use of quantized models, you, you won't be able to, to benefit from the speed. And you also want an efficient runtime. So runtime being something like TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers, which takes the model, figures out how to run it, and then applies the kernels to the, the buffers and gives you your output. So these are all the core things that are, are, are really important. Um, and this is the workflow generally for, for machine learning, but it's a little bit different for tiny ML. So I, I'll kind of go through this and talk about the different steps and how they apply to TinyML. So generally what you want to do is figure out what do you want to do? Like what, what is the problem I'm trying to solve? You then get a data set and you then train a model and then you tweak the model and add more data until either it works or you've decided that it's too much effort and it's not going to work. So you kind of go in a loop and you keep adding more data. Finally, when you're satisfied, you can deploy the model and then once it's been deployed, you can monitor it to make sure that it's working. So if I start to think about this, like figuring out what you want to do on embedded machine learning, so with TinyML, you want to keep it as simple as possible because we're talking about constrained devices. They can't necessarily do really, really ambitious things. And it's always good to start with a really simple test case and try that out and make sure that that really simple thing is feasible on the device that you're trying to deploy to um, and within the constraints that you have before you spend hours and hours trying to make it work because it might be just that it's it's not 
not possible. So try try and get a really simple subset of what you want to do and test it out first. So secondly, when you're obtaining a data set, it's really important to get data that is from a representative environment um, that's equivalent to where you're going to be um, deploying. So if you're training a model that's going to be running on a factory floor, then it's good for it's well, it's vital for your data set to be from that environment. Because if you train the model on data, maybe it's it's trying to recognize people's voices and the background noise it was trained on was background noise from inside of a lab. And then you try and take that model and you deploy it in a noisy factory, it may not work. Same with the sensors. Like I mentioned, um, if you're using different types of microphone, it's probably better to use the same one throughout. Um, if you, you can do some stuff around data augmentation, which minimizes that, that, those problems a bit, but um, it's good to try and keep the same sensors that you're using in, in production. When you're training a model, you also want to apply optimizations to reduce the size of your model as a part of this loop. See no, number four, where we're tweaking the model and adding more data until it works. We need to know that it works with the optimizations applied, because otherwise it doesn't fit on our device. There's no good having a, a model which works really well, but when you compress it, it, do, it, it doesn't work well anymore. Um, so it's really important that you, you apply those optimizations while you're, while you're training and evaluating and adding more data and trying to make it work just to see if it's possible um, once you deploy the model you've got to make sure that it runs fast enough on the device that you're targeting um, because it's no good if you're trying to do something where you're like recognizing when someone has scored a goal if you're um, uh, playing playing football if it tells you that the goal was scored 20 seconds after the goal was scored, that's not very helpful for anyone. Um, so you want to make sure that the, the model runs fast enough on the target you're deploying to. So early on, you should take a version of the model. It doesn't even have to be one that is very accurate, but it should have roughly equivalent size and architecture and see if it runs fast enough on the target, see if it has enough memory on the target to run. We have some good tools in Edge Impulse for this. It will give you an estimate for the latency and for the memory usage, but it's still really good to deploy it onto the device and see for real, does it work? And then when it comes to monitoring the model, this is, oh, we got a, a question for Stephanie. Yeah, so if, we, if you have a, um, a small data set of sound um, and you want to expand it during training, is there some strategy for doing that? And yeah, the, the, the answer is yes. So there's a bunch of ways you can do data augmentation with sound. So um, one of them is mixing in background noise. So imagine you've got your, your sounds. You can um, basically randomly mix in different background noises. So like it could be the noises of a noisy factory. It could be the sound of a, a house. It could be the sound of outside on the street. And you can take your original samples and mix in this background noise to create loads of new samples that have different variations of different types of background noise. And then there are some other more technical things. There's, um, there's a, a really cool um, strategy called Spec Augment. Uh, I'll, I'll write uh, the name of that in the chat. So spec augment, that was a technique developed by a team at Google. And basically, when you're doing inference with audio, as you've probably seen, you use spectrograms um, to feed into your network. So you have this um, frequency domain representation as a, um, a grid. And what you can do with spec augment is you can actually just block out rows and columns of the grid randomly during training. So it's very fast because all you have to do is replace the values with zeros. Um, so it's, it's really easy to do. But you just maybe randomly block out a couple of columns or a couple of rows of the spectrogram during training. And this is equivalent to having the model um, not receive all the information 
with the signal uh, uh, about the signal for those things so it will learn you're forcing it to learn to classify correctly even when some information is missing and this means that if the information is missing for other reasons like if there was a really loud noise while someone was speaking or if there was some interference or something like that um, the model would still be able to understand what was going on so that's a really cool technique and um, does this increase the chance of overfitting so actually it does the opposite so that's the really cool thing is because you're randomly changing the data it's almost as if you have a bigger data set um, because you've you've got for every one sample maybe you make 50 versions of it with different types of background noise and you can make a, a thousand versions of it with different bit rows and columns chopped out and because you're training your model on a much larger data set, it's less likely to overfit, which is, is really cool. So it's a really, really good technique to use. And both of those are in Edge Impulse. If we, if you actually, sorry, the spec augment is in Edge Impulse. And I'm working on adding the background noise part um, right now, actually. I'll, that's what I'll be working on when I, I leave this talk. Um, so. I talked a, a little about this parrot project already, so I don't I don't need to go into any any more information about that. But I I, I thought that was super super interesting. Um, we have this this is the device with the um, the antenna there that can communicate with the satellites. We have the um, little Arduino Nano thirty three BLE sense, which I, I talked about earlier. Which is, and then is a, we a we still we are we are we are seeing the last. Uh... The last image with the machine learning workflow. Oh, interesting. Um, has that? It's not updated. Yeah, is okay, the. Me, I'll stop presenting and I'll start again. Um, so one second. All right, do you see a nice parrot? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Um, okay, so this is this is the parrot I was talking about um, that's living in Amsterdam. And did that update now with a new image? Okay, good. Yes. Um, so this is the device that um, that we built. So you can see the antenna there, the purple thing in the middle. We're just using that Arduino um, to run the model. And that has the microphone on as well. It'd probably be better to have an external microphone, but um, and then there's a, a battery there. And with that battery, it's a pretty, pretty big 2600 milliamp hour battery. So this thing can run for weeks and weeks um, without without running out of, of power. So that's a really cool thing. So I, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about like what is the state of the art of embedded machine learning in industry in 2021? Um, so this is what this is not just the state of the art of research, but this is what actually is possible if you're an engineer working in the field. And there's actually a big difference there because um, you see a lot of papers coming out talking about all sorts of different new techniques and um, really, really cool, interesting stuff. But it takes quite a while for that stuff to trickle down into the hands of engineers. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, but it's essentially, you know, it takes time to build production ready software implementations of things which researchers create. So it takes a while for things to end up in engineers' hands. And this is this is kind of what engineers have access to now. So we do have some some cool models. So we have model architectures that work with all sorts of different types of sensor data. Um, we have signal processing pipelines that work really well with these models. So this is like things like the process we use to generate spectrograms for audio models. Um, those have been very well, well um, kind of debugged over, over many years. And we have some basic model optimization. So we can do intake quantization and run that on, on pretty much any embedded device really at this point. We do have some accelerated hardware. So um, you can make use of um, hardware DSP for signal processing and SIMD 
uh, for signal processing and ML. So a good example of that is on ARM's, ARM's SimSys libraries, which you can use for speeding up signal processing um, and you can speed up inference. We've got some ultra low power microcontrollers which have access to signal processing hardware that can accelerate signal processing. So um, ETA Compute, for example, they have a, a, a um, chip which has a signal processing um, hardware implementation that can improve the performance of, of audio signal processing. And we even have embedded neural network accelerators with a specific purpose. So Sentient have a really cool one. They're, they're an interesting company. Um, if you, you look them up, they have this product, which is custom silicon that implements a fixed architecture deep learning network. So I think it's three layers of 64 neurons. And you can switch off some of the neurons. So it's sort of between three layers of between one and 64 neurons. Um, or it might be a different number, like 128. But it just lets you upload or da download to the device whatever weights you want that network to have. So you can train a model that has that same architecture um, on your, your machine in Python. And then you can send just the weights for the architecture onto that device. And because it's implemented in hardware, it's unbelievably ridiculously fast because it doesn't have to be general. It just has one architecture implemented in silicon. And that's really, really cool because there are some drawbacks to having a fixed architecture. You know, it might not be the best architecture for doing everything you might want to do. But often, if you can run really, 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 really fast, that can make up for that a little bit for some, some problems. And what they've developed this thing for specifically is for speech. So if you want to do really, really low power, really fast, accurate speech recognition, like, uh, sorry, keyword spotting. So recognizing when people have said a keyword, um, this is a, a really good chip to use. So there's, there's lots of things like that in the pipeline that people are coming up with that are really interesting that maybe implements one particular architecture for one particular purpose. Um, we also have some, some really cool end-to-end -end tooling. So Edge Impulse, which is you know, the, the, the platform that I, I work on and help build. Um, we can ingest any type of data. We can train models without having to do much programming. You can keep track of different versions of models and um, you know, make sure that your project is, is repeatable. And then you can deploy easily to uh, easy, uh, easily to different targets. So even if you are working with one of those sentient microcontrollers, which implements a fixed architecture, um, you can just, you know, train a model specifically for that and deploy to it. So there's there's other other products out there that help you do this type of thing. Obviously, I I like ours, um, but the, there are a few of these kinds of systems out there. Um, but there are some things that we really need still, um, things that haven't been figured out yet that are going to make a big difference with embedded machine learning. And I want to share that with you because. You are the people who are going to go out and build some of these so that we can integrate them into Edge Impulse. So this is my this is my list of things that I want you to go out and build um, if you if you're interested. So one of the big things is software support for state of the art optimizations. So this is an example of where I said that things take a while to trickle down from research into the real world. So you've probably heard about pruning. Um, so pruning is this idea that you can take out some of the weights from a network and just make them into zeros. And you can do that without affecting the accuracy of a model. And that means there's less information in the model, which in theory means we have to do less work in order to run the model and the model will take up less space. But in reality, there isn't much software support for pruned weights, which we, we call sparse weights, out there. Um, if you have a model that's pruned, you can run it. It will run fine, but it won't run any faster than the model that wasn't pruned. 
and that on on most devices and that's because not much time has been put into creating kernels that make use of sparsity so what someone needs to do is go out there and, and write some of these kernels that basically make use of the fact that there are, are gaps in the the weights um, and also it helps to have some hardware support for this as well so it's not necessarily strictly a software thing um, another example is is bnn so binarized neural networks so these are, are neural networks that instead of having maybe 256 possible values for an 8-bit quantized weight, they have two values, a one or a zero. And um, you, you can train a model that has these, these one-bit weights and it, it works, but there isn't good software support for that. So we don't have the kernels again. So that's another cool thing to work on. Um, another one is embedded specific deep learning architectures. So right now, a lot of what people are doing is taking an architecture that works on a, a server, and then they're just trying to make a slightly smaller version and have it run on an embedded device. That's a, that's a cool thing to do. It works. But what about architectures that are specific for embedded devices? Like, why, why would we assume that um, a big model that we've just made a bit smaller is going to work better than something that was developed from the ground up to specifically work well in that constrained space. So this is a really important thing. We're doing some cool work on this um, at Edge Impulse right now. Um, but I, you know, there's, there's so much that can be done there. Um, smarter division of the embedded ESP and ML workload. So this is a, a crazy thing, right? Um, if you're running like that, that Parrot model that I showed you, where you've got the, you're taking in audio from the microphone, you're running it through signal processing, and then you're running a machine learning model to figure out if it was a parrot squawking or not. The signal processing part of that takes 10 times longer than the machine learning model does to run. So that's crazy, right? Because the machine learning part is the exciting, new, sexy part that you know we all really are, are fascinated by. But Right now, actually, it's slower running the signal processing. And so if we can figure out what is the best balance, because in some ways you can push the complexity to one side or another. Like maybe if you do really intense signal processing, you don't need much machine learning model to get good results. And that's, that's kind of the situation we have right now. But what if you do less signal processing, but you have a bigger model? like maybe you can have a better overall latency. So figuring out how to move that fulcrum and change that balance is very, very interesting. Um, and I think there's gonna be a lot of progress made there. So that's a really good thing to look at. And that the biggest thing, one of the most important thing is having public and commercially usable data sets for industrial applications. Because a lot of people want to do things like anomaly detection, like finding out when there's a problem with the, the power pylon. And um, there's not much data out there for that, that type of thing. So when people are trying, like researchers are trying to develop new model architectures that are good to run on embedded devices, they also need data sets to use that are characteristic of the type of stuff that people want to run in the real world. And so that's why this is so important because right now they're there really aren't many of these data sets out there. And where there are data sets, sometimes they're available under a, a license which doesn't allow you to use it for commercial applications. So this is a really cool thing to get involved with. I guarantee of, of all these things, if you were to create a data set that is relevant for industrial IoT, for example, and can be useful for some of this stuff, you will be um cited in, in in thousands of papers right you'll be famous because this is a big bottleneck right now for all of this there's tons of people coming up with you know new ways to do all the the fancy stuff but really what everyone is hungry for in industry is data sets and data sets they're useful for training models but they're also useful for benchmarks so figuring out um is a particular architecture better than another so those hopefully give you some ideas for things that you can you can work on um, on the 
kind of um, infrastructure side of embedded machine learning. So if we go five years ahead, um, what are some of the, the things that are going to be important and what is embedded machine learning going to look like? So five years, it's not long, but it's a long time in technology. So it's my personal belief that this is going to be a transformative technology that really touches every single person on the planet. And to some degree, it already has because it's in mobile phones, which are everywhere. But I think it's going to be something that's, that's in every product, um, involved in every person's life. So I think it's going to be demanded by industry and consumers. So people are going to expect that products include some intelligence in the way that right now, you know, pe most people expect lot their, their consumer products to be smart. So maybe they've got some kind of like smart capability. They can connect to the internet and, and do this or that. Um, I think in, in five years time, it's going to change and people will demand not that something's connected to the internet, but that it has intelligence that runs on device. Um, I think that embedded ML will be running on a majority of embedded devices that are deployed in the world. And that will be a combination of things where we didn't have ML before, but you can add it to a fire firmware update. But it will also be because um, embedded ML creates so many more reasons to deploy embedded devices. There are so many new applications that we're going to see loads more devices shipped because they do useful things that are powered by embedded ML. I think most microcontroller architectures are going to have some kind of hardware support for something related to embedded ML. It might be just as simple as having lots of ROM available for a big model, but it could be as much as like having some acceleration or signal processing on board. I think almost all embedded engineers will have worked with embedded ML. And I think that advanced tools um, are going to be critical to developing and deploying stuff um, to these devices because these embedded engineers, they want to work with embedded ML, but they're not ML engineers and they, they need some support from their tools to be able to do the stuff that they want. So finally, I want to talk a little bit about why you should be working in embedded ML. And that's you know maybe something you're already convinced of because you're doing this course. Um, but I think there's some, some really exciting stuff. So I think, you know, you can make this huge impact on the world. Microcontrollers are the most common type of computer. So if you're writing software that runs on them, you have a massive impact. And I think this, this technology is going to be adopted very broadly. This is also where machine learning meets the real world. Like we often talk about edge devices, and that means it's the, the edge of the network and the beginning of the real world. And so that makes there be loads of exciting opportunities here to do things in every possible field, whether you care about self-driving cars or um, conservation of elephants or building robots that work on the moon, um, any, kind of, any kind of thing you can think of, there's an opportunity for embedded ML there. There are huge research opportunities. Like I, I went through some of them already, you know, on, the, on those few bullet points I showed you, but there, there are huge opportunities for solving some real problems here. And it's right at the beginning. So you have a good chance of publishing a paper that ends up being really important. You're building a better future because if we look at those, the, the BLURP acronym, a lot of those things can help people, right? So if you can build things that are low latency, um, you can help people with safety. If you can build things that have better privacy, you're helping everybody have more privacy in their lives. If you can build things that don't need lots of bandwidth, you can build stuff that can go out into places where people don't have good connect connectivity and still provide them with things like really good medical care maybe. So you, you, you have a lot of opportunities to build a better world using this technology. And it, it, like I said, it kind of touches almost everything. So no matter what other stuff you're interested in, you can find a place where embedded ML will, um, will touch it. So I wanted to show you a, a little um, vision demo, but I think I've probably run out of time. I can show you something quickly, but maybe it would be better if, if no, 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 it's okay. Questions. No, go on then. Or, okay, okay, cool. 
So let me show you this. This is something I did really quickly yesterday, um, just to show off how our object detection training works. So um, I think uh, if I go to the data acquisition tab here, you can see I've collected a really small data set of items um, that I've labeled with bounding boxes. And I'm just tra I trained this model to detect a glass. So when I'm holding a glass, I have the same glass here. Today it has some fruit in it, so maybe it won't work. We'll see. Um, but I've, I've trained this model to um, try to, to draw a box around this glass. And I, I wanted to show you a couple of things. So I kind of wanted to show you the importance of context when you're training and also the importance of um, accurate bounding boxes. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to connect my phone. So that I can run on here. So I've just um, scanned this QR code. You, you may have played with this already, but basically it now set up my phone so it's like a sensor that can connect to Edge Impulse. Um, and so you saw in my data set, most of the images showed glass with my desk as a background. Oh, it's very slow. Okay, there we go. So we've got it just in front of my computer no, it's, screen. It's, it's still, it's still, is, is it still showing the glass? The um... oh, did it change again? Or no? Yeah. Oh, interesting. One second. I will yeah. present again. All right. Sorry. Sorry about my slow internet connection. Um, no. So hopefully you can you can see the glass there. It's always on the same kind of background. It's like in in my hand or it's sitting on the desk. Um, and what I want to do is show you like this working. So if I go on live classification, I can take a picture from my camera. Um, and I'll take a picture of the glass on the desk and hopefully it's working. So it's uploading now. And we're classifying. Fingers crossed this has the box around the glass. OK, cool. So you can see there's the raw image. And we were able to draw a box around the glass. So that's great. So what I want to show you now is like. Oh, no, it's, it's frozen again. <laughs> it's probably not working as well. At least with me here. Ah, so what can know. you see currently? Uh, it's um, the, 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 the capture, you're only waiting for a start in my case. Uh, yeah. Okay, let, let, me, let me show again. Okay, hopefully now you can see the result. Yeah, we see the result. Okay, perfect. So this is a 70% probability that this is the glass, or this is a glass. So. What I want to do now is um, show, take a picture of a glass on a different background, and we'll see how that affects it. So I'm going to take a picture on the floor here. So I'm going to click my button there, and then all right. So hopefully, I might have to, to restart the screen sharing again. We'll see. It's going on. Yeah, G good. Okay, cool. So did it? Okay, so the result came up. So you can see here, this is taken a picture on the floor on the carpet, and it's the same glass, similar angle, but it didn't recognize it at all. And the reason is that it's basically just on a different background, and my data set didn't include this background. And so even though the glass is exactly the same, the background really, really matters. And so that's a good example of how important it is to have a training set that reflects what type of environment your system is going to be deployed in. Because if I was just training this based on the desk, I can be convinced that it's working really well. 
um, because I keep getting good, ex good, good results when I'm taking pictures of the glass on the desk. But all I did was move it to somewhere a few feet away and it's no longer working at all. Um, and, and that's, you know, things like data augmentation can help a little bit with that. Um, but especially for vision, because you can't augment the background that easily, it's really, really important to, to think about this. And when you're constructing your data set, you need to include lots of different examples of, of lots of different situations. Um, so the, the other thing I want to point out with this is um, around bounding boxes. So this is sort of something that I've noticed a lot of people have had problems with when they're working on object detection projects. And so you see this. Um, oh, here actually, I have this labeling queue here, which lets me draw boxes around items. So this is a, a picture of a glass. So I can label it by drawing a box. And um, hopefully you can still see this. Is this all appearing correctly? But I, you are so, doing you are doing in real time with uh, the studio, the the, um, the, yeah, the so bounding these, box. These are, these are these are some pictures I, I took earlier. Yeah, so I'm draw, I'm drawing the boxes on using using um, studio, mm. and what I I could do, you know, is I could label this in a few different ways. Like some some people might think maybe I should because I'm labeling this glass, I should label just the glass. So I don't want the box to have any pieces which are not the glass, so these corners. So maybe you'd want to do it like this, where the box is only over the glass. There are no things here. Maybe I'd want to do it like that. Do you see what I mean, where I'm kind of like, I don't want any of just the desk in the background. I only want the glass. OK. But actually, that isn't, that isn't great, because there are bits of things in this image which actually belong to the glass, but when I'm training the model, the, the system is being told that only the square part is, is the glass. So it will be more difficult for it to understand what's going on. So another thing you might be able to do is like, oh, okay, I'm just gonna put a big box around it like that. And that looks okay, except there's a lot of stuff in here apart from what is in the what uh, apart from the glass so we've got loads of background here and that is confusing for the model as well because it has to think okay maybe this this dark thing at the back is part of the glass and it will be really really difficult for it to understand what's going on across the data set so what you really want to do is make sure you get the entire object but and get as little as possible other than that so drag it like this so it's mostly perfectly on the edges of the object. And the stuff that we capture other than that is fine. There's nothing that we can do about that, but it's just good that we've caught the whole thing. So if I, I can save that one, and we'll move to the next one. So this is a, this is a headphone, right? This isn't, this isn't the um, glass at all. And so I don't want to have this bounding box at all. And that's another good point that you can have negative examples which show just the background without the item that you care about. Um, so I've, I've done that here. So I've got a nice image here which doesn't contain the box, but it doesn't contain the glass. Here's another one with the glass. So uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's still the last one with the glass, the, oh, oh, the, the okay, bounding okay, box okay. and glass, yes. Um, so I was so I was showing a headphone. I unfortunately let me stop presenting again. Okay, hopefully that's working. Uh -huh. um, so if I I can show you the the data that I just captured there. Um, oh, sorry, I think it's in my test data. So it was it was this one. If you see the headphones there, uh -huh. so this is like a, a negative example. So I can move that to my training set, um, and then this becomes an example of a picture that doesn't have a glass in it, and that's just as important 
when you're training a model because you want the model to be able to understand when the thing you care about isn't there as well. Um, so that's just some tips for, for labeling um, an object detection model. Um, you want to have nice, neat bounding boxes. And you want to make sure there are some negative examples in there too. So that's that's pretty much um, it that I had to uh, had to talk about. But and I think we've only got five minutes left as well. Um, <laughs> but I'm very happy to answer any more questions we have. I'm sorry for taking up so much of the time. Uh, but if you do have any more questions or thoughts, oh, okay, Gabriel, okay. Um, you have a question. Oh yeah, just a, a quick one. Uh, do you know if uh, big tech companies are already investing in this field or in hiring? Pro <laughs> sorry, and hiring professionals to work on on end products, or currently the tiny machine learning is just uh, not not just, but uh, still a research area. Because I really enjoyed studying this this subject, and yeah, I, I wanted to know. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, it's a really good question. Um, so, I, you know, it definitely is something that um, big tech companies are excited about. I think that the the overall um, size of the the number of engineers working on this is still relatively small um, compared to something more established, because it's only been around for a short time, and there's. There are, there are more and more products that are using embedded ML, um, but it's still something that's relatively early in its life cycle. So I, I think that it it's not like you're going to find as many jobs as if you were looking to just be like an, an Android developer or um, a sort of very established field like that. But I think that that is going to grow quickly. So. Um, that said, if you if you want to work in the field, I think finding something that um, if if you're trying to do something something very hands on, there are lots of companies that build products like physical hardware products, and I think a lot of those companies, if you think about will they have this blurb kind of benefit um, from from the elements of that acronym in for their products they'll probably be thinking about using embedded machine learning in sometime in the next you know couple of years so it's a good time to be if if you if there's a company that has some really cool products that are hardware products that you're you're interested in i'm sure they're starting to think about this type of thing now yeah thank you yeah thank you you are? Uh, 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 my question is about the uh, edge impulse. Uh, how can I send data, especially uh, audio data, because uh, the edge impulse has the uh, data forwarder, right? That you can mm -hmm. send any data from the serial, but it, it has a frequency limit, right? Uh, about mm -hmm. 400 hertz, right? Um, and in, in Brazil, we don't find the Arduino Nano uh, 33 so easily. Uh, and I was using the SP32, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and how can I send data from, uh, for an example, from the SP32 uh, audio data, uh, since it's, it's not a support supported board, right? Uh, yeah. I, I remember you have CSV support, right? But I don't know if data, uh, audio, audio data can be sent uh, that way. So you can, yeah, so if you can capture the um, audio, uh, send the audio over serial and then just log it to a file on your development machine, then you can, um, you know, if you just save it as WAV files, you can upload the WAV files with the Edge Impulse uploader as well. So. That should work. And um, if you if you run into any problems with that, uh, you can just post a message on our forum, 
and send me an email. My email, um, I was just showing it actually, I'll show it again. Um, feel feel free to contact me if you if you like. Um, my email is just dan at edgeimpulse.com, which ho hopefully it's on the screen there. And uh, post post on the forum and then send a link to me with the, the forum post and I'll make sure that um, it gets looked at quickly. It usually <laughs> does anyway. We're pretty responsive. Now it's working. Well, only only a, a small comment. In, in fact, I was prepared for the, the class today, but I will do the next one. And my, for example, my during the weekend, I did a work, a project, a small project, capturing uh, temperature from the sound. I was make a, we made an experiment with a different hot water and uh, and the cool uh, cold water. So I captured all the data set to 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 define the temperature, but with the sound. So in wow, fact, I prepared cool. to them. I prepared to them a presentation. I show you with all the steps, including how we can have the sound capture it with my phone and send it to Ed Impulse Studio. So in fact, the class today was I, I said six six ways in detail about how we can have data to upload to data to to to, to the studio. Oh, <laughs> so we will, awesome. it's perfect. It's like the, your presentation, the next class will be perfect. <laughs> awesome, awesome. That sounds really cool. Yeah. I, I'm excited to see that. Yeah. Um, yeah, like I, 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 I definitely say if anyone does run into any problems or get stuck with anything with Edge Impulse, let me know or post on the forum. We're very responsive. And I'd love to hear your feedback as well. If you're um you know trying to do something and it doesn't work well or there's something you prefer it works in a different way um let us know your feedback it's really really helpful fantastic then if you can if it's possible for you to send me the presentation because i i, mm -hmm. I post the the video plus the presentation to, to the to the hub of the class so mm -hmm. and people could, can uh, see in more detail and i you put your your Twitter and so on, so on. So I, 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 yeah, I, I leave to the guys. Yeah. Excellent. Well, th thank you so much for having me. It's been, <laughs> been really fun and you had some really, really good questions. So I'm super excited for all of you. You're, you're going to be coming out and, and, you know, leading this field forward in a, a, a sh very short time. Oh, I, I must tell you, I must tell you, my friend, I, I, I must to, so thank you, thank you very much. It was fantastic. It was a fantastic couple of hours. I think that uh, you know, you you went you know far beyond what we have discussed. I think the guys, they are they, they are working with this from the last uh, like two three months. They have they are working very very exciting projects. You know regarding sound vibration. You know uh, so we have four or five projects that they must present in the, in August. For the, the the close of the course, and for sure I send you the the project so you can see what the the your students your students now you are also a teacher of this course so you can see what they are doing okay <laughs> yeah that sounds fantastic I'm I'm really excited to see those that's really awesome and you know if if we we have a blog at Edge Impulse if you have cool projects that you'd like to share um and you want like a a, a big megaphone to share them with, then let, let me know and we can have you on the blog. Fantastic. Yeah, we'll do that. Awesome. Guys, I think, yeah, I think that you can send the, the, the questions to them. No, uh, we can direct the, the, the next question. I think it's good. I think it's, it, it's, it's time now. <laughs> Fantastic. Awesome. Thanks a lot, my All friend. Right. Yeah, I, 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 I hope to see you soon. <laughs> yeah, have a have a wonderful afternoon, and uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. All right. Bye bye. Right. Wow, what? Foi fazer um chavinha para o português agora. Foi muito bom. Obrigado, pessoal. Fantásticas perguntas que vocês fizeram. Acho que foi muito, muito bom, hein? Legal. Eu acho que Eu aproveitei demais, aprendi muito no, com, com todo mundo aqui, com o Dan. O Dan é fantástico, um cara... Eu tenho acompanhado ele nos últimos dois anos e realmente é um, uma pessoa excepcional. Eu acompanho ele no Twitter, vale a pena, eu escrevo, a gente troca ideias no Twitter, um acompanha o outro. Eu, eu sugiro vocês lá, tá bom? Obrigado por ficarem o tempo todo, obrigado por fazerem perguntas muito boas. Eu acho que vocês... vocês 
elevaram o nome da Unifei you know, para um, uma, uma empresa que hoje é líder no, no mercado, esse cara está em contato com todo mundo, amanhã cedo eu tenho, eu tenho reunião com o pessoal de Harvard, a gente vai, eu vou comentar da reunião de hoje, vou deixar o vídeo depois com eles para eles assistirem também. Eu acho que vocês estão de parabéns, vocês estão de parabéns, vocês me, deixam, me enchem de orgulho. <risos> Obrigado, pessoal. Bom, eu acho que hoje a aula já acabou, né? E a aula que eu estava preparado, eu vou deixar para... Pra... A gente deixa para a aula que vem. Eu, talvez eu vou publicar, porque exatamente a aula de hoje, o que eu ia mostrar, são exatamente... Quer ver? Eu só vou... Só um segundo para vocês verem o que eu ia mostrar hoje. Acho que vale a pena só para vocês saberem, mas é legal, porque eu acho que é interessante vocês verem qual, qual, que, era, qual que era a ideia. Só um segundo só, tá? Vou mostrar para vocês aqui. O que eu ia mostrar exatamente para vocês, um pouco das perguntas. Eu ia mostrar as várias maneiras de a gente subir os dados, né? o que nós já vimos, tá ok? Os a gente tem vários tipos, como é que eu subo os dados. Tá? A gente tem um videozinho que o Guilherme fez para a gente no Windows, eu vou passar para vocês. Tá? Então, a gente ia fazer todo, todo isso aqui que faz na aula que vem, tranquilo, mas eu vou deixar já para vocês. São todas as maneiras a gente subir dados devagarinho para o Edge Impulse. Inclusive, a pergunta que vocês fizeram agora, como é que eu subo, como é que a gente subiria dados aqui, né? por exemplo, dados de som.wave. E o exemplo que eu vou deixar para vocês, que a gente vai trabalhar, que é o exemplo de psicoacústica, que é exatamente a gente pegar, foi um exemplo que eu fiz aqui, trazer os, que o que o Dan comentou na aula, que é trazer a, os dados para o teu computador, e do computador a gente sobe para a Edge Impulse os, o som. Uma vez que eu chego lá com o som, eu quebro ela em pedacinhos, tá certo? E executo. E aqui eu estou fazendo toda a conversão com espectrografia, né? modelo normal, procedimento normal, e aí fazer o deployment, o deployment do projeto no. No, no Arduino, tá? A gente vai fazer isso na aula que vem, a gente faz tranquilo e eu, eu, eu mostro com calma para você, mas eu vou deixar já para ajudar vocês nos projetos. Lembrando que os trabalhos foram adiados né, uma semana cada um, então o que vocês vão entregar hoje para mim, que era do segundo laboratório, né, com um acelerômetro, vocês entregam na próxima semana, né? E o do som, que foi da semana passada, entrega então em duas semanas mais, né? E é legal, porque daí, de repente, eu vou deixar, vou deixar com vocês aí para vocês verem. E qualquer dúvida, a gente conversa durante a semana. Tá bom? Combinado? Muito obrigado aí, viu, Marcelo? Foi bom ah, demais, cara. Eu ah, e depois, só, só fazer um pedido. Passa o Twitter dele para a gente. Não, tranquilo. Tranquilo, tranquilo. Eu, eu, vou, eu vou passar... Eu vou, eu, eu, eu vou depois fazer... Tá, põe na apresentação, mas eu ponho direitinho lá. Pode tranquilo. Beleza, obrigado, viu? Tá bom, né? Obrigado a vocês, gente. Boa noite. Tudo de bom. Obrigado, valeu, professor. Boa noite. Valeu, valeu professor. Boa noite. Valeu, valeu. Até mais. Até mais. Até mais. Até mais. Até mais. Até mais. Até mais, Stephanie. Obrigado. Muito obrigado.